Good afternoon, everyone. This is Mike Romali here with the Hurricane Outlook and discussion for August 9th, 2021, at around 2.10 p.m. Eastern Time. A lot to talk about today, including the potential for a tropical storm to be forming within the next 24 hours or so, and tracking in the general direction of the Greater Antilles and what impacts it may have for those islands and the potential impacts to the Bahamas and Florida downstream. So let's go ahead and jump into everything. Taking a wide look across the tropical Atlantic this afternoon, we have a couple of things going on today. First of all, Invest Area 94L. This has been the newly tagged Invest as of yesterday, and this system is well on its way to becoming at least a tropical depression, if not a tropical storm. We also have a system out here in the far east Atlantic, south-southeast of the Cabo Verde Islands. This wave will have to be monitored over the next several days as well, as it generally traverses westward. Again, conditions out here still aren't necessarily the most favorable right now, but conditions will be coming a little bit more favorable over the next couple of days as this traverses uh, westward with time. So again, we can kind of see this here in the graphical tropical weather outlook from the National Hurricane Center as of 2 p.m. this afternoon. The old invest area 93L now down to a 0% chance of developing, so this wave is no longer really worth monitoring over the next couple of days. This is the wave with the highest chance right now, 94L. And again, this will be moving uh, just to the north of Barbados later today and tonight. And then, of, of course, this will now be entering the island chain. And then after the island chain, it's going to be very crucial. There's a lot of things that could be happening over the next couple of days with this. And we can kind of see this here on the visible satellite imagery from this afternoon, really. Again, this updated just about 1.55 p.m. Eastern Time. Today, we can tell that there's a lot more better organization to the overall structure with this. This is the island of Barbados right here. We notice that, again, we have a fairly decent structure consisting of a little bit more banding on the western side today. We have a little bit more in the way of banding, but no real banding here on the eastern side. There's no real banding to the structure on the eastern side. And that's kind of really well represented that we don't really have a fully closed low level circulation at the moment. However, we do have some pretty vigorous convection that has kind of been popping off all day across this region. And this has kind of promoted uh, some surface pressure falls in this region, indicating that uh, we could be getting ready to have a closed circulation. Definitely indicative that we already have a very formidable mid-level system in here. And again, this is traversing off towards the west and northwest. So this will be impacting the island chain within tonight. Now, again, we can see here from the ASCAP pass uh, from about uh, 7 a.m. this morning, uh, what we actually had, oh, I'm sorry, this is 8 a.m. or 9 a.m. this morning, rather, excuse me. From 9 a.m. this morning, the scatterometer pass indicated here that we still have a very broad uh, open trough right now. We can kind of see that the trough axis is still kind of positioned from south southwest to kind of north northeast like this and again that's one of the things that we talked about yesterday that this trough axis again was more aligned yesterday like this from southwest to northeast and today it stood a little bit more vertical it's still not a hundred percent vertical this line is not uh this but it is becoming a little bit more vertically aligned and as this moves off towards the northwest like this again this trough axis will align more vertically and on the northern side of this, where convection is most prominent, this is where you'll probably get your closed low-level circulation to form. Again, right now, it's still pretty broad. It's not a closed circulation. It's still L-defined. But with this deep convective uh, pulsing that we've been seeing all throughout today, uh, this will likely lead towards, again, the surface flux response and, in, in turn, again, lowering of the pressures, that low-level center that actually forms, the circulation that tightens, Etc. and all those the processes that go on behind the scenes there. We're not going to get too into depth about that. But irregardless, this will likely become a closed circulation probably sometime tonight or early tomorrow morning. And for that reason, again, we could see advisories issued on, potential trop on a potential tropical cyclone as early as 5 p.m. this evening, if not maybe 11 p.m. or uh, 2 a.m. But again, we're kind of watching for impacts to the islands. Again, right now, Barbados is going to be on the southern fringe of this, but you could still see some impacts here as these convective bands try to rotate around. Again, they're not fully rotating. It's not the most well-defined structure I've seen, but it's definitely a lot more defined than what we've seen yesterday. Now, in the long run, there's going to be some potential limiting factors with this, and we can kind of see this here represented 
uh, on the water vapor imagery that we, again, don't really have a very well-defined circulation at the moment. We also have a lot of dry air that's being transported into this. And as we get a circulation that forms uh, in here, it's going to be more susceptible to dry air intrusions because, again, it's going to be pulling a lot of this flow around and cyclonically like that. Again, so all this dry air is going to be wrapped around. And this is one of the things that the model forecasts have very well been indicative of the last several days is that all this dry stable air to the north right here could be uh, ingested into the storm's engine, basically, into the core, system, core center of the system. And as this traverses westward again, or towards kind of the west-northwest like that, that's going to be one of the things that's going to be very important because, again, the weaker the storm is, and because this is going to be dealing with a lot of land interaction, the one thing that the storm is going to be dealing with is a ton of land interaction because, again, on its current trajectory, it should be moving more west-northwest towards the island here of Hispaniola. And it's going to cross over Hispaniola and potentially over Haiti as well. And this is going to create, again, a lot of disruption within that storm's inner core. So if we actually have a storm that is not well-defined, this may be able to survive the land interaction that is down across this region. And for that, we're going to have to really monitor to see if it stays weak or if it does actually develop an inner core uh, as this moves off towards the west-northwest. So that's kind of one of the things that's going to be very important here at that particular time. And again, there's also going to be increase in shear uh, as the storm moves towards the west. Again, we're going to have uh, kind of a positive PB streamer, an upper level low that's going to be sitting off screen here that will be pumping in a little bit of westerly shear and kind of separating the main vortex from the moisture source uh, as this moves off towards kind of the west northwest like that. Now, if we look here at the uh, kind of under the hood, this is the 850 millibar vorticity map. So this is the spin in the atmosphere at about 5,000 feet off the ground. And for context here, these reds and whites, that's your high cyclonic spin at your 5,000 foot level. We can very clearly see again today that we have this uh, energy here that is near the island chain right now. And again, this energy is actually pretty well stacked right now. Again, we have more of a bundled area of, of vorticity. It's not strung out like we kind of see here. And even with Kevin here in the tropical Pacific, this is still a little bit elongated and goes to show that, you know, the tropical Pacific isn't as, you know, supportive for development as we once thought. But again, uh, it's, it's pretty round. And this energy source, again, it's still a bundle of energy. So even for sake, if this doesn't develop, this will likely go on to produce some very heavy rainfall to portions of the Lesser Antilles. And then eventually, once this makes its way towards Puerto Rico and uh, the Dominican Republic, Hispaniola, Haiti, etc., uh, this could be dumping a lot of heavy rainfall. So even if this doesn't become, you know, a tropical depression or a storm, uh, this will still be dumping a lot of heavy rainfall, could still bring tropical storm force uh, gusts to the region. Of course, you get any under any of those convective bursts that end up kind of forming. And that's the one thing that you could have. So it's very important to kind of understand that there is a lot of processes that are kind of going on here that, again, it's just more about the impacts and it's not so much what's the category, what's the definition of this, whether it's a storm, depression, a hurricane, or just a tropical wave, it will bring impacts because this represents energy in the atmosphere. Now, the one thing that the storm will have going for it, or 94 I will have going for it, this is the upper ocean heat content map updated as of this morning. Again, for context here, anywhere from the lighter blue colors onwards towards the right of the scale indicates some pretty formidable upper ocean heat content values. So not only does, is there warm water at the surface, there's warm water at depth and quite a lot here. Again, this, the system right now is just entering an area where the upper ocean heat content will gradually become better and better. And the expected track is something like this. And again, it's going to really matter because if we get a storm to just kind of wobble, maybe a little bit more northward, uh, this might have a chance to cross over the island here of Hispaniola, the Dominican Republic, and the move uh, just to the north here of Cuba. And this is going to be one of the things, again, whether it's over Cuba or north or south of Cuba, where it's offshore in that warm water is going to have all the difference and make all the difference for whether or not this becomes a weak system versus a potentially a little bit more of a stronger system. Now, 
we can kind of go to the models for help with this. This is the GFS forecast, the 850 millibar vorticity. And this is the 12Z run valid for 2 p.m. this afternoon. And again, for context here, these darker oranges and reds, that's your high cyclonic spin at 5,000 feet. Again, we can kind of see our little system embedded in there right now. And if we take a look here at the vortex average sounding for this region, again, this is a valid for 2 p.m., so just about now. Again, we can see that there's a little bit of dry air in the kind of the mid levels, but in the upper levels, there's also some pretty formidable moisture. And at the surface, there's a good bit of moisture, not a lot of shear across this region. So it's not really going to be doing anything to push a lot of this dry air in. And that's one of the reasons why we keep seeing these continued convective bursts, because again, this dry air is not really working its way in. But if we look here beyond that at the mid-level relative humidity in the atmosphere, this tells a little bit of a different story. And again, we just sampled the area just immediately in and around this system. Now, for a broader perspective, again, this is the mid-level relative humidity. And we notice that there's a lot of dry air just in front of this near the island chain. And again, if we go back to the satellite here, we can also tell that there's not a lot of moisture out in this region. There's just a lot of cirrus clouds over here, but there's no real convective activity that's over here. And you can kind of see some of this dry air right through here kind of working its way through the islands. Now, again, this dry air is sort of moving with the overall net flow of the trade winds and with our storms. So it's all relative. The the dry air is moving west along with our system 94L. But again, because the fact that this tries to develop a circulation, this dry air creates, uh, or the circulation creates a funnel for this dry air to work its way in and basically isolate the circulation from its moisture source, the apparent moisture source. I mean, you can kind of see that, that in the GFS forecast by hour 30, here's our storm right here or what is whatever of 94L. And we can see this moisture uh, is basically almost severed away from everything else. This dry air has kind of cut off uh, a lot of the moisture supply and would get fully ingested around our storm and keep working its way closer towards the center. And that's one of the reasons why we don't really have a well-organized system on this particular run of the GFS. Now, eventually, again, you can kind of see all this moisture. This dry air does eventually get worked out, but the moisture, again, is basically funneled through, and our system is into parts of the greater Antilles, and at that point into Hispaniola. And at the 850 millibar vorticity map, again, you can kind of see that this is what is ever left here of our storm uh, out through that time. And here's another tropical system in the Pacific. But again, we have a big ridge of high pressure over here that's going to be pushing our storm generally towards kind of the west or maybe even southwest for a little bit. And then eventually this may even end up on the Gulf of Mexico side here uh, over the next couple of days. This is indicated here by the GFS by about day five. We have a little energy source, what's, what's left here of 94L that ends up making its way into the Gulf of Mexico. Now, if we back this up here and we look here at the 200 millibar winds, this is the, the upper level winds in the top of the atmosphere. And again, for the time being, we have an upper level anticyclone that is enveloped around the storm. So for now, the storm actually has a pretty formidable environment to undergo strengthening if dry air does not make its way into the inner core. And that's going to be kind of all or nothing. If dry air make, makes its way in, you're looking at a storm maybe no more than about 30, 40 miles per hour. If dry air doesn't make it into the system, you're looking maybe closer to 45, 50 miles per hour for kind of an upper end echelon, just a rough kind of guesstimate there for the upper end uh, so far. Again, the main problem here is because it's going to have such short time. Uh, but if it is a smaller system, again, you know, very susceptible to rapid changes up and down in intensity. So we're going to have to really watch that. Now, after this point, however, again, the wind pattern starts to change. We get an upper level low that's kind of cut off here. And we notice that the shear direction starts to change as this upper level anticyclone begins to break down and you have more of a westerly wind component across here. And this creates a little bit of vertical shear distribution. After that time, however, the shear direction starts to change. You do get an upper level anticyclone just after about five days. This is by... Uh, 2 a.m. Sunday, August 15th, you do have an upper level anticyclone that is positioned over the Florida Straits at the moment. 
But what is indicated here on the GFS is that we get a storm to form kind of in this right region here, the kind of this right front quadrant. And this would uh, mean that we have a lot of shear that is blowing from southwest to northeast, so kind of in a north and east weighted system once again, which would be mainly a rainfall threat to parts of Florida. Now we can also look here at the European forecast. Again, this is the Euro 12Z run here. And what we can see here on the Euro is that we do have a much more coherent storm. And we can tell that, again, it, it is still weak, but what's interesting about this is it actually kind of scrapes the island here of Hispaniola, and it never really crosses the island. It doesn't actually cross the island. It stays north of the island, makes its way to the south of the Turks and Caicos, and maintains itself in the Bahamas. And one of the reasons why we don't see much strengthening in this time is because positive PV streamers in that shear, which again, we can kind of take a look at uh, if we jump here to the 355 Kelvin, we can see that again, we will have a pretty strong PV streamer uh, that is going to be across here and also across here, which means again, for models like the Euro, this is kind of what it's picking up on. And the shear is a lot lighter. But if we have a stronger storm through here that moves north of the islands, and moves kind of north of Hispaniola and Cuba, makes its way into the Turks and Caicos, this could be a problem that eventually, for maybe a potential stronger storm, I really wouldn't go much more than a strong tropical storm. We can look here at the GFS forecast and the ensemble mean sea level pressure to kind of give it an idea of what we could be looking at here. And again, the GFS ensembles aren't really too keen on the, that idea either. Again, there's a weak signal here for a weak area of low pressure to be somewhere uh, within the vicinity of Florida by Saturday or Sunday. And again, that's going to mean all the difference to what's going to happen kind of downstream with that. Now, if we look here at the H war forecast, this is the 12Z H war run. And again, it's showing much of the similar solution. Again, this is for on 12Z Friday, so 8 a.m. Uh, Friday. You notice what we have here is a storm that, much like the Euro, is north of uh, north of Cuba here on Friday, but is very disorganized. We can see that there's a mid-level center down here, and there's a low-level center that is fairly sufficiently displaced by over, uh, this, this is really uh, over several hundred miles. Uh, in fact, away from our storm. And again, it's, you know, not really looking all the best. And uh, we can kind of even move this forward. And again, now, uh, eventually here, the GFS, or not the GFS, but the Euro does eventually try to catch this mid-level center up with the low-level center, where it vertically aligns, and you have a storm coming into South Florida here, kind of moving off towards the northwest. And eventually, you know, this is about 997 or so by the time it makes landfall, which would mean that, again, this is a pretty formidable system, you know, a decent looking tropical storm. That is a healthy looking tropical storm uh, on approach, uh, you know, into Florida at the moment. And then eventually this would continue then probably back out into the Gulf of Mexico side. So, again, there's a lot of things that we're going to be having to look here. The 500 millibar vorticity, again, very discoherent, very disorganized. And then eventually, once it gets into the better part here by day five, we can look at why that's the case. And if this wants to potentially load, it's not going to. Uh, but for the most part, the main reason why we're seeing this is because the shear relaxes and we get a, a storm that, again, doesn't consist of land interaction with Cuba. That's going to be the biggest problem here in the short term. So there's a lot to kind of watch here over the next couple of days because, again, we could be looking at a storm anywhere from just north here near the Bahamas uh, to a very weak disheveled system that is still inland over Cuba uh, by Saturday uh, afternoon or morning. So there's a lot to watch here over the next couple of days. And, of course, I will be back here consistently doing video updates on that. So with that being said, hope you have a great rest of your afternoon and evening. Of course, I am Michael Romali. I'll talk to you guys again some more tomorrow.